Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in just a few minutes. We want to just allow some extra time for people to get um, to join and get settled. So we'll be with you shortly. So, hello, welcome to our event today. Um, my name is Vanessa Fairhurst, I'm Community Outreach Manager at Crossref, and I'm joined today by my colleagues Rachel Lammy, who's Head of Special Programs, Kirsty Meddins, who's Product Manager, and Paul Davis, who's our Technical Support Specialist. To reduce background noise, we have everyone on mute. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can write them in the Q&A box um, and we'll get back to you there. I would like to encourage you to use the Q&A box for questions rather than the chat, just because this makes it easier for us to know which questions have ans been answered and to keep track um, of the responses there. You can also view any questions that other people have asked um, and you can upvote any that you think are important or that also apply to you. However, if you do want to say hello in the chat and tell us where in the world you're joining from, that would be great and we'd be happy to hear from you. The webinar is being recorded and we will share the re webinar recording later, um, probably a in a few days time next week, along with the presentation slides and we can share the Q&A transcript as well. So let's get started. So this is our agenda for today. We'll be talking about um, an a bit of an introduction to Crossref, a bit of a background um, about us and how we got started. We'll talk about content registration, different tools to do this, um, as, way as well as ways to update and maintain your metadata. We'll then take a short break uh, where we'll answer some questions and people can just go away, um, get a drink, go to the bathroom. Um, then we'll come back in the second half. We'll talk about our new participation reports tool, which will help you know what metadata you're submitting to Crossref and how you can improve your metadata records. And then we'll talk a bit about our different services at Crossref, including reference linking, cited by, similarity check and crossmark. Then we'll close today with um, talking about some of our wider community initiatives and where you can go to get further help and support. In total, it should last a, a maximum of two hours. It might last a bit less than that. Uh, we can see how we go. So first, I'll give a bit of an intro to Crossref. Um, so Crossref is not just about DOIs. We're not defined by a particular service, but by how we fit into the scholarly community as a whole. And this is our mission. So Crossref makes research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. We're a not-for-profit membership organization that exists to make scholarly communications better. And this is a little bit about us. Um, so this is a picture of the Crossref team uh, back in May 2019. So this was our last all staff get together. Uh, this year's was online. So unfortunately, we don't have a, an interesting photo like this. Um, but we have about 40 members of staff based primarily in um, Boston or in the Boston area in the USA, um, with some staff also in the US based remotely in Los Angeles and Tulsa, New York. Um, but we also have staff based in Oxford in the UK um, and also some remotely um, around Europe in London, France, Germany. Um, so we're not as big as an of an organisation as many people think. Um, we are quite small, um, but we are quite diverse and geographically spread. 
So Crossref was founded in 2000 with 12 publisher organizations, and we now have over 14,000 um, members around the world. Um, as I said before, we're not for profit. Um, and if you do want to read any more about um, different members of staff, we do have a people page on our website and you can learn more about our different roles and a little bit about us there. So a bit about the governance um, of Crossref. We have advisory groups and committees to get input and advice from our members. Um, this is tends to be for more established services and content types. For example, we have advisory groups uh, for books, um, similarity check, crossmark, uh, the funder registry. We also have a 16 member board, <coughs> which represents our diverse membership. The board is comprised of commercial and non-profit, open access, subscription, and publishers which have different models and includes representatives from organizations from a range of different countries. Um, one of our truths at Crossref is one member, one vote. Um, so this means that we include um, all of our members um, in voting for our board elections. Each member has a vote. Um, with that said, I want to mention another important item is that we started our elections for our board of directors. So ballots and information were sent to the voting contact of your organisation on the 30th of September. And we do encourage all el eligible members to vote. Your vote's very important to us, and the results will be announced at our virtual annual meeting, which will be held on November the 10th of this year. Um, a bit more of an overview of Crossref. So as I've already said, we have 14,000 member organisations um, around the world. We're based currently in about 125 countries. We have a metadata store of well over 117 million content items. Uh, which is growing every day. We offer a wide array of services to ensure that scholarly research metadata is registered, linked and distributed. So when members register their content with us, we collect metadata about that piece of content. We process it so that connections can be made between publications, people, organisations and other associated outputs. And we preserve all the metadata that we receive for the scholarly record. We make it available across a range of different interfaces and formats so that the community can build tools with it and use it. We'll be talking you through some of our services um, later this morning. And who uses Crossref? So it's probably more people than you realise, um, publishers and funders to indexing services, data analytics systems. And this number continues to grow year on year, especially as we expand the different content types and the related metadata that you can register at Crossref. But the largest group um, of our members are publishers and they come in all different shapes and sizes. And so why do publishers join? Well, primarily it's to help get their content discovered and to show people where this content is located and to easily update that if and when the content moves. To drive more traffic to their publications, turn references into hyperlinks, find out who's using their content and participate in other collaborative services. Um, and this graph here just shows how our membership has continued to grow year on year. Um, <clears throat> At the end of our first year, we had 51 members and affiliated organisations. In 2012, participation in our sponsoring programme began to increase. So sponsors are affiliated organisations and they act on behalf of smaller publishers and societies who wish to register their content with Crossref by providing them with technical and language support and also help with billing and services. And then by last year, we had almost 3,000 new members and affiliated organisations join in, in those 12 months. So we've moved away from the word publisher to focus more on the word member, as not all of our members self-associate as publishers nowadays. Uh, they create and disseminate content, deposit metadata of Crossref, and they're able to vote in our board elections. Members pay an annual fee to Crossref, which is based on their publishing revenue, and they also pay deposit fees for all new DOIs. We also work with third party service providers and metadata users who do not contribute to the metadata store, but make use of it via our API and search interfaces for a variety of different purposes. So we'll be talking to you a bit more about the uses of metadata uh, later as well. 
And this just shows you where some of our newer members are coming from. So this data is for the years between the 1st of January 2017 and the end of last year. Um, and our membership's really growing outside of the US and Western Europe, which is where our first members came from. We're seeing a new type of audience with different needs, um, and we need to have conversations to figure out what those needs are and to make sure that we're meeting them. Increased collaboration with community partners is one of the ways we do this, as is increased outreach efforts such as events like these. Um, as with most organisations, our in-person events are on hold for, the, for now, but hopefully we'll be able to resume these later next year, uh, focusing on regions where we are seeing increased member growth. So in the last three years, we've had over 6,000 new members join from around the world. The largest areas in terms of growth um, of new members, as you can see, are Asia Pacific and Eastern Europe, with nearly two thirds of all of our new members coming from these regions. Nearly a third of these are, are non-profit organisations and around half are really small publishers um, with 100 or fewer DOIs registered with Crossref. So it's a lot of metadata being deposited. And as our thousands of publisher members register um, their content with us, we reached the milestone of 100 million content items in late 2018. And our metadata store continues to grow exponentially. So what are our members registering? Again, this might be a more diverse list than you would expect. So our largest type is journal um, articles, with books being the fastest growing content type. Um, our newest type is posted content or preprints, uh, which, although small, is still a rapidly growing area. And we also have um, newer content types as well, such as grant IDs for funders. And this graph gives you a bit more of an idea of the breakdown of content registered with Crossref. So nearly three quarters is journal content, uh, but we are starting to see a growth in a range of other different content types as well, such as books, conference proceedings, reports, data sets and standards. Now my colleague Rachel is going to talk to you about the different ways in which you can register your content with Crossref. That's great. Thanks, Vanessa. And yeah, thank you for um, for joining the, um, the webinar today. Um, now that Vanessa has talked all about the, the types of content that you can register, um, let's take a look at how that actually happens. So when registering content, what you're doing is you're sending Crossref the metadata of each item or information about it. So let's look at the different ways that you can send us that and the kind of information that needs to be included when you register content with Crossref. So first, um, a note about DOIs. So many people associate Crossref with, um, with DOIs or digital object identifiers. Um, and we wanted to make the point that it's important to understand and remember that it's not just, it's not just about the DOI, it's not just um, about that, that number. Um, we're not defined by a particular service, but it's how we support the academic community as a whole. And sometimes people think that DOIs are an indicator of the quality of the publication or some sort of quality stamp um, or a mark of quality of the research presented. It isn't any of those things. It's really just a persistent link and identifier for a content item, which then helps it be found and discovered in, in lots of other um, in lots of other systems, um, tools and services used in research. We'll start first by talking about creating your DOIs. So when you join Crossref, you're assigned a unique prefix for your account in the format 10 dot and then, um, and, then, and then a series of numbers. In some journals, you might see DOIs with prefixes that only have four digits. Um, the original prefixes that we had um, and that we gave Crossref members started with four digits, but have been five digits since, um, since 2012. Basically, we, we used up the four digit ones. Um, some of the, the organizations or the members that join us only have one publication or one journal that they want to register. 
um, and some have and some have many or a mixture of content, for example, a journal and then um, and then some books. One prefix can be used to register all of all of your content. As I said, even if you publish different types of content like books and journals under that prefix. And if you add a new title or pub or start to start to publish a new publication, you don't need to notify us prior to registering content for that. Once you begin to register articles, for example, for that publication, that title will be added to your account and will recognize that automatically. Each of our members has a unique publishing schedule, so that could be weekly, monthly or even yearly, and DOIs can be registered at, um, at any time. There's no minimum number required, um, so you can just register as many as you need to use um, over, over the course of your membership. Um, the prefix that we give you is um, is used to create a unique digital object identifier for each content item. So to talk about how the, the DOI is, is made up, it's comprised of three sections that you can see in different colors on the slides. So the red part is the resolver address. So each DOI is a unique identifier for the piece of content that you register, but it's also an actionable link which means that it can be resolved or clicked on in a browser. The blue is the prefix, which is assigned to every member when they join in that 10.x, 10.45 digit number. And then the, um, the yellow part is the suffix, which is the part of the DOI that gets assigned by the publisher and is unique to each content item. So each member has said that has the unique publishing schedule and unique publications. So the suffix is something that we don't give you, you decide upon it, depending on, on what makes most sense for your publication. And joining those things together, the resolver address, the prefix and the suffix gives you the whole resolvable DOI. We get lots of questions from new members about creating a suffix for their DOIs. Um, because the DOI is an opaque identifier, meaning the, the numbers and the, the letters themselves don't necessarily have any meaning, there isn't a prescribed fo format that you need to follow. So when you're, when you're putting together your suffixes, our best advice is that they should be consistent, simple and short. So consistent and simple for easy management. So you should establish a pattern that's easy to maintain for your publications. Short is always good so that they don't take up much space when used in, in citations. Um, I would say the longer they are, the more likely it is um, to, to, um, for, for people to have errors whenever they're trying to use them. And it doesn't need to, to say anything about the item that it's identifying. So it doesn't need to be something like an acronym for the journal, that the information that you register alongside the DOI tells us what it is rather than the, the, the letters or the terminology that, use, that you use in the, in the suffix itself. Um, you can use the letters A to Z, the numbers zero to nine, and certain characters like hyphens or parentheses. Some members use the ISSN or volume and issue numbers. Some use a title abbreviation, um, which again is, is, is all fine, but as said, for, for our purposes, that doesn't actually, actually mean anything. So consistent, simple, and short is, is the best thing that we should, that you should that you can stick to. And there are more details um, and advice on our support page, which is linked to in these slides, which we'll share with you after the webinar. So we have some display guidelines for DOIs, um, which, which, um, which, which talk about the best practice for displaying a DOI link. 
we had what we like our new display guidelines aren't very new anymore. They went into effect in 2017. Um, but it's important that members follow these guidelines for consistency. So any researcher reading one of your papers can easily recognize what the, um, the DOI and for the usability. Crossref DOI should be displayed in the full URL wherever the, the bibliographic information about the content is displayed. So on the, on the landing page for the, for the article in, in a lot of cases. Um, HTTPS is the secure protocol. So that was one of the changes that we made in 2017 um, to, to comply with, um, with web best practice. But you might see older DOIs with the format dx.doi.org. If you have DOIs that are in that format, you're not obligated to change the format of existing DOIs, but new DOIs should have this, um, this updated version um, that you can see in blue on the slide. Once your content is registered with Crossref, users will be able to retrieve identifiers and create links using them. So the DOIs that you register need to resolve to either the full text, if, um, if, you, um, if your content is, um, is openly available, or to a landing page that you maintain and look after. So the landing page should contain the, um, the full bibliographic information of the article. Um, so things like the title, the authors, um, title, the authors, maybe ORCID IDs and abstract. Um, the DOI displayed as a URL, as I showed on the previous slide and instructions on how to access the full, the full text of the, of the piece of content. That might be via a login or a subscription, or the content might be open, um, might be open access, in which case they can just download it directly. So access to the full text is always controlled by the, by the Crossref member, but the landing page needs to be available to all readers so that when they click on the DOI, they know that, they're, that they've been directed to the article or the book or the preprint that that DOI was referring to. When you register your content, you send us um, basic, basic metadata or information about each item you register. So each content type has slightly different metadata specific to that item, again, so that it identifies it uniquely. So this includes that, that information like the titles, authors, publication dates, issue numbers, ISSNs, ISBNs. So anything that describes the content that you're registering and we collect that in a standard form. We have minimal requirements, um, sort of basic requirements, because we need to support a variety of publication practices. But best practice is to send us as much metadata as possible and that it be accurate and clean. So the, the, more, the more comprehensive or the more metadata you send us in relation to your publications, the more likely it is that people will be able to find and use your, your content via the DOI. We also collect um, additional metadata about the items being registered. So this can include things like the, the reference lists, information on who funded the research, ORCID IDs, license information. So if your content is open access, and um, you can let us know that by sending the, us the license it's registered under, clinical trial information, abstracts, and information about relations um, between different items. Um, we have a service called Crossmark, which collects valuable information on things like retractions, corrections, updates, and more, so that anyone reading the, the paper can, can find out if it's up to date or not. And we're always adding to this set of metadata over time in, in response to, to what our members need to, need to send us. 
And there are several different tools available to register your, your content. And I think this really depends on, um, on your, the time that you have available, um, what types of content that you're registering and your sort of, and your, your kind of level of, um, your, the level of, um, I guess the kind of technical level that you're comfortable with is the best way I can describe it. So there's the option, if you're comfortable working with XML, you can upload an XML file um, via our, um, our admin system at doi.crossref.org, or you can send metadata to us programmatically. We have a web deposit form where you can simply copy and paste information. Um, if you use OJS or Open Journal Systems, there's a plugin that I'll show you, which can also help register content with Crossref automatically, or the metadata manager tool, which again is a more um, is a more manual way to um, to send us to send us metadata and register your content. It said to start with the XML itself. Um, all of the metadata that comes into our system is ultimately in XML format. Crossref has its own specific um, metadata schema for deposits, um, which is basically, it's a set of rules defining what can be included and in what format. Um, because we have so many publishers sending us information, for that information to be comparable and for it to be reused in different databases, tools and services, we need to collect things in a, in a consistent format. So our schema is fairly rigid in terms of the information that we collect, but also it's, it's, it's very comprehensive in terms of the volume of information about um, publications that it can collect. So some members register their content by creating their own XML files using our schema, and then they can upload that to our, um, upload that, um, to our system, it said either um, programmatically or by um, manually uploading those files. Um, just to walk you through and show you some examples, um, the initial XML you create for, for content registration needs to include metadata and identifiers. So they also need to appear in a defined order. So looking at this example, um, you can see things like journal metadata, such as the title and the ISSN, and information like volume, issue, and dates um, about the, um, for the, um, for the, the specific, um, for the specific issue of this, um, of this journal. It also has some member specific information in the head section. So every time um, someone registers content with us, it, can, it should include an email address, which is used to send out information about when your file has been processed. It said a, every journal article has this additional basic information, like the article title, which is key, the author name, publication dates, and of course, the information on the DOI itself, which you can see towards the bottom of the screen. So when you're sending the XML, you can send us the DOI that you've created for the content. And the resource is the landing page of where, the, um, of where a reader or a user can access that content. It said the metadata collected for different content types will differ. So there'll be a different set of information collected for a journal article in comparison to maybe something like a book chapter or a preprint, but you'll be able to supply a title, contributor and a publication date for, for all of them. When your file has, um, has been uploaded or sent to us via one of our systems, it gets added to a submission queue and you'll receive a notification that it's been received. As said, and that will be sent to the email address that was included with your deposit. Most files get processed within a couple of minutes, but it can get delayed if, if the traffic is high. So 
if you've submitted something and you don't get a confirmation that you've done that, you can log into the admin system and look to see if your deposit is still in the queue. And if there are any issues with the um, the processing of the queue, then we'll work to we'll we'll work to we'll work to resolve that. But normally, I would expect to to receive a confirmation that we've received the deposit in a couple of minutes, and that it's been processed. Normally, a, a couple of minutes later. Once your metadata is submitted, said you'll get an email that says if it's been received, and then one to say if the deposit is successful or if it failed. If it's processed successfully and you get a message to say success, then you're done. Your metadata is in our massive database and you can start displaying your DOI and linking your content. So if you're not sure if uh, the registration has been successful or not, the best way to check is just to, to try to click on the DOI that you've just registered. And if it works, then it's been received and processed by our system. If it doesn't work, if you're getting to, sent to a page not find link, um, then, chance, then chances are something's gone wrong at some point and you can get in touch with us and we can figure out, um, figure out what's happened. It said, we know that not all of our members are able to generate their, their own XML and we have many that use these alternative options. So, our web deposit form is a manual entry form. Um, it's very simple. You enter the, the information on your publication field by field, and behind the scenes, it writes and submits the XML for processing to our systems. Um, you can use this form if you're registering journal or book content, conference proceedings or reports, so you don't need to know XML at all to use this tool. And it can also be used for um, supplemental metadata deposits, such as funding and license information via a CSV file. Said um, lots of our members um, also um, publish their journals using the OJS or Open Journal Systems platform. And um, thankfully, OJS has a really good plugin that we built in collaboration with them to help, um, to help members register their content with us. So we work with PKP who run OJS on this. So to, to use the, the most recent and the best version of the plugin, they recommend using at least OJS 3.1.2. Um, so in addition to, um, to content registration, we've also got some additional plugins. So one for reference linking and depositing, one for providing funding information, and one for the, um, the authenticate system, which is used with similarity check. These are all available starting from OJS 3.1.2. Today, we're just going to talk about the content registration um, plugin, um, but for these additional ones, we're, we're hoping to do an OJS webinar later this year to talk members through the, the kind of the full set of, of plugins that can help participate in Crossref services via OJS. If you want to set up the Crossref plugin in OJS, um, the way to find it is that um, to, to log into your OJS instance as a journal manager, um, go to the settings menu, website, and then to plugins. Under installed plugins, you can choose the import export plugins and find the Crossref XML export plugin. You can click the box to the right of the DOI plugin description to enable it and expand the plugin options and click on settings to, to configure it. Um, and again, there are instructions, um, there's a link on the previous slide um, to show that information, which we'll send out. Once you're in the settings section, um, 
you can enter the depositor name and email address. So the person, um, the person at your organization who needs to um, who needs to get the notifications about whether deposits have succeeded or failed. Enter your Crossref membership credentials. So this is the information that we sent you. Um, so your, um, your user ID and password for our systems that you got when you registered. And select whether or not you want the plugin to register DOIs automatically on publication. And that's something that OJS do recommend that you do so that it happens automatically. It said, do make sure you put in the name and email of someone who's responsible for looking after the Crossref deposits, because that will be sent to them um, and follow up if needed. Um, if you don't know your login and you want to set up your OJS system to deposit to Crossref, then you can let us know and we can, we can work with you to either create or send you that information. A couple of in important things to note. One is that the plugin will deposit DOIs with Crossref on publication, but your DOIs will still take a little bit of time to be processed. As I mentioned, it's not immediate, but should only take a few minutes. Another key thing is that the plugin doesn't automatically update DOIs if metadata changes. That has to be done manually. So, for example, um, we get a lot of emails to our support team about, um, about um, incorrect um, author information related to papers. So if you're updating OJS to change author details, to add an author that you might have missed, you need to remember to resend that information to Crossref so that it can be updated with us as well. Without sending that, we don't know that information related to the publication has changed. It said, and if a DOI deposit is failed and you get an email about that, um, you can click on the failure link in OJS to get a report of why the, why the deposit failed. And it said, there's more information at PKP's community forum and in their documentation if you want to read into this, um, if you want to dig into this in, in more depth. Um, we also have a tool called Metadata Manager, um, which is available only for, um, for journal articles at the moment. Again, if you're interested in using it, you can go to the website linked to at the bottom of this slide. And again, use the same username and password that you used for our admin system or the web deposit form. And at this link, there's also a really good step-by-step -step guide in terms of how to, how to use this service um, because it's, um, it, would, it, it would take too long to, to work through today. When you log into Metadata Manager, you will see a workspace. And if you've logged in before, it will contain a list of your publications if you set them up. The first time you log in, it will be empty until you add your titles. And as you add the titles that you want to manage in Metadata Manager, they will start to appear on this screen, like you can see on the slide. You can add new titles and existing articles that you've previously submitted to our system from this space. And you can click on each title to, to add or to edit articles. I think the key thing that we find is that if you've already, if you have existing titles, um, don't try to set them up as new publications in Metadata Manager. Um, use the search box on the home screen to search for and add existing publications from there. Because if you add new publications, our system can get confused as to whether something is new or existing and that can cause issues. When you click on the on a publication um, workspace, you'll then get the option to add and deposit articles. As I said, the system only supports journal articles at this point. And the tool supports the registration of articles by 
offering a simple, flexible way to register and update, um, update metadata. And you can see the kind of fields that you would expect to find in the Crossref metadata. So things that we've covered already, like the title of the, the article, um, the dates of publication, and um, the abstract information. And actually, I think we're going to also add um, abstracts to the web deposit form soon as well. Um, it saves the journal level information um, as you go, so you don't need to re-enter it every time. And you can also add um, additional, um, additional um, metadata that I talked about before, um, such as things like funding information, the reference lists, which it will check um, to see if any of the references match to DOIs that we have, additional information like licenses, and, um, and cross-mark information as well. The other thing to note if you're using the um, Metadata Manager is that once you click deposit, the deposit is in immediately processed and the results are displayed um, for accepted and rejected deposits. Um, so you, you, can, you can wait on this screen and see right away whether your deposit succeeded or failed. And anything that's accepted, as I said, the DOI will be live and start to start to work if you click on it. And the deposits also get archived and are available for reference on the deposit history tab, which is located on the top menu bar. You can register articles from multiple issues in one go or just a simple, sim single article. And the editing form, it validates or checks the metadata that you enter to prevent problems when you submit the article for registration. So it tries to kind of figure out any issues in advance of, um, in advance of, you, of sending information to us and the metadata being rejected. Um, whatever um, method of registration you use, it's really important that your metadata be accurate. The information needs to be the right information. So misspelled or missing author names, bad license URLs or um, URLs that, that don't point to the content or don't work, they can, they can be problematic um, and meaning that people can't find your content. Um, complete and current metadata are certainly things that, that we are focusing on at Crossref as well. And we want to make it as easy as possible for members to update their metadata, keep track of updates, and to collect or refine new metadata as, um, as we start to collect more, more fields or more information that our members are asking for. Um, I'm going to pass over to um, to my colleague Paul now. Um, he's going to talk about updating and adding additional metadata. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so there is going to be times uh, when you'll need to add more metadata to an existing DOI, or you'll find that you actually need to make an update to, to the metadata. There might be an error or um, details might have changed. Um, So Rachel spoke about it earlier, but um, I guess what do we what do we mean when we talk about Crossref metadata? Uh, when registering content, our members supply us a, a wide range of metadata, including um, basic metadata, which um, Rachel mentioned earlier, which was titles, author names, ISBNs, etc. Uh, we have funding information license information, full text URIs or URLs, which are used for text mining and similarity check, uh, cross mark updates, ORCID IDs, and um, recently we've had uh, peer review reports, relations, uh, grant IDs, and um, coming soon, um, organization IDs. So in the context of Crossref, uh, metadata is the information about the publications which we then make available to thousands of our other parties um, to use in their tools and the services that they might provide to the community. 
when people look at your content um people search crossref not by the just by the doi um but also by the author name the orchid id etc even an issn it's help it's helpful to register all authors uh, and not just the first author uh, the more information that we have or that you supply um, with your dois um, the easier it is for people to find your content uh, we do charge for some forms of metadata delivery um, but for some exception uh, but mostly um, our metadata is publicly available at no cost our metadata is used by a, a huge range of organizations such as funders who want to identify the research outputs from their funding uh, repositories and libraries who want to enhance their metadata or register DOIs, uh, data analytics systems, and uh, reference managers who and anyone who uses uh, scholarly metadata. After registering your content, it's, it's really important to keep all of your metadata up to date. Sometimes there are errors or changes that we mentioned earlier that need that need to be made in the metadata. Um, it is important that readers can always find the most up to date content that is published. Incorrect or outdated metadata will not help researchers to find content. If there is an error in your metadata, it's necessary to send the correct metadata uh, to us. And we're going to talk about how to do this now. If you only need to update the URL, for example, uh, if your website has changed the location or the content has moved, uh, you can send us a CSV file into the technical support team. Um, that will need to include DOIs and the new URLs. We will then in, our, in the support team, we will be able to update all of your records so you do not have to do each one individually. Uh, a, new, a new DOI should never be assigned uh, for a URL update or a title transfer. Um, we like to keep the DOIs as persistent as possible. And so all of the updating can be done into the, in the metadata or in the background based on permissions. And there are never charges to update the metadata with us. Everyone will make mistakes. Uh, typos in metadata is in metadata are bound to happen uh, even for the most careful of users um, as i said earlier we never charge for the metadata updates additions or corrections so cost won't be a barrier for getting the most accurate and thorough metadata possible for us as we saw earlier uh, if you want to look at your basic metadata you can use our metadata search interface it presents a segment of the metadata it doesn't show you everything, um, but it lets you know some of the basics and you can search by the DOI or an ISSN article title or author and it's, uh, it's free to use. If you are using Metadata Manager, uh, the system will display errors with a red flag um, and then it'll have a description of the error in, in those boxes. Uh, these errors will need to be uh, corrected before the deposit button is activated, which you can see in the yellow box here. Um, if there are no errors, then that deposit button should show up. If it doesn't, then you probably need to contact us in support. Uh, editing your metadata. The review all feature um, in Metadata Manager, it allows you to do a final check of all of the metadata that you're going to deposit to us. Um, so you can click on the review all just before you're about to send that article to deposit. Just helps uh, evaluate your own accuracy with all of your metadata to make sure that uh, it's correct before sending it to us. To correct or update metadata that you have against the DOA already registered with us, um, you can do a few things. Um, the first one, you can redeposit an XML file with all of the updated metadata in it. That uh, can be sent to us directly in where well, you can do it manually in the admin system or it can be done programmatically. Um, 
if you're used to using the web deposit deposit form um, it can be a bit fiddly to make those changes uh, for example if you've misspelled an author's name uh, you would need to manually type in or copy and paste the corrected last name you sorry you wouldn't just need to correct the last name in the author uh, you would need to enter all of the information into that form again before resubmitting um, with each redeposit of metadata the system will overwrite the existing metadata that we have um, so you would need to make sure that you've included all of the metadata available uh, for that record before you redeposit to us and if you're using metadata manager the process is much simpler uh, the, the, as Rachel was showing earlier the full metadata record is retained um, or it's been imported into the system um, and so you only need to correct the error itself before redepositing If you find a metadata error um, in an article which you initially registered in Metadata Manager itself, uh, you can locate the article in one of two ways. You can nav navigate through the list of accepted articles within your given journal container. You would have uh, seen these lists when you were um, clicking through Metadata Manager tool. Or you can actually search by the article in the deposit history uh, once you've located that article, the one that you want to correct, uh, you can click on the article title to open up the metadata in the record. Uh, from this screen, you can make the necessary corrections to um, whatever it is that needs updating. Once you've uh, completed the corrections, you just click on the continue button on the top right and then click on add the deposit if you're ready to redeposit it to us. Uh, after that, the process is exactly the same as how you would deposit a new article. So add to deposit. If you uh, previously registered an article using the web deposit form, um, an XML deposit, or even using the OJS plugin, uh, you can still use the Metadata Manager to correct an error if, if there is one. Uh, first, you'd need to import the article's metadata into Manager. Um, as default, the articles are not populated in the workspace on Metadata Manager. They will need to be added um, manually. To do this, uh, you can click the relevant journal um, on your, in, in your workspace in Metadata Manager if it's there. If it's not, you can import that using the um, import journal. Uh, search box you would just need to search for the journal title and then click on the add then we would come to this screen here which is uh, you can see we're in the journal of the cardiovascular development and disease if you want to add an article that's already been registered with us against that journal you would just in the article box start searching on the title of the article once that comes up in the list click on the add button and this will import the articles metadata into Metadata Manager ready for you to um, update or correct. Um, from here, you can use Metadata Manager in the same way, click into the title and uh, correct the metadata and deposit as you would normally. Uh, upon a successful deposit, you will receive this summary screen uh, if it's successful and it says you've got accepted deposits, then great. You don't need to do anything more. Your DOI is updated um, and the metadata against it is. Uh, but if there is an error, you would need to troubleshoot that based on the error that you get. Um, it should have a, a red exclamation mark, which appears um, you, and which should tell you some errors, um, troubleshooting errors. Um, can be difficult but if you get anything like that then you can always email us in support or um, take a look at some of the help documentation reports um, we have uh, our conflict and resolution reports um, which we send out um, and they can help with identifying metadata errors 
The conflicts, uh, conflicts most often occur for two reasons. Uh, metadata registered um, against the DOI isn't sufficient to distinguish between two items, um, or two or more records have the same or very similar metadata, um, which would suggest that it's a duplicate record. Conflicts can be resolved by either resubmitting the correct or richer metadata to distinguish between the two DOIs, or um, you might need to um, create an alias relationship so that the incorrect DOI uh, links to the correct one. Resolution reports are sent out via email at the beginning of each month, and they include statistics about DOI resolutions uh, from the previous month. When a researcher clicks on the DOI itself for an article, uh, that counts as one resolution, one DOI resolution. No information is captured about who is clicking on the DOI um, or where they're coming from. Um, and a separate report is generated for each DOI prefix. The, the statistics are based on the number of DOI resolutions on a month by month basis. Um, these statistics can give an in indication of the tra traffic generated by users by clicking on DOI. Uh, the report shows the top 10 resolved DOIs for that prefix, um, but we don't unfortunately have information on every DOI. If you, uh, if you have a high number of failures, which it will show in the report, um, don't panic, um, but please do pay attention. Sometimes uh, this can just be an error, a user error in typing or cutting and pasting DOIs incorrectly and then trying to resolve them. Um, but it could also alert you to a DOI that has been distributed but not yet registered. The reports are a really good way to check that um, the DOIs that, you that should be registered are with us and those that are registered are done so correctly. Uh, make sure that the right person in your organization is receiving the reports. If you find that it's not the correct person, then you can contact our membership team on the email address on the slide. Okay, thank you. So we're now going to take a brief uh, break. Um, it's just gone five, um, five to the hour. So I think if we could all come back at five past, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, we've got a couple of questions, I think, in the Q&A that we will answer. Um, and then we will get started again um, after the break. So see you all in about seven minutes time.
Okay, I hope everyone has managed to grab a drink or go to the bathroom or just have a, a quick break there. Uh, we're about to get started again. Um, just for anyone that joined us a little bit later, just to reiterate that if you have any questions, any point, you can write these into the Q&A box. Um, and we'll either answer them live or uh, one of us will respond to you via text um, there. Um, any questions that we don't have time to get to by the end, we will answer these um, offline and then we'll send a Q&A transcript to everyone afterwards. We are also recording the webinar, um, so we'll be able to send you that along with a copy of the slides um, after today's webinar, probably early next week. Um, so I'm going to get started now with talking to you a little bit more about MESS data in a bit more detail. Um, so people often think that Crossref members have a defined set of metadata and that our metadata is complete and fully comprehensive as represented by, represented by our Crossref Zebra here. But that's not exactly the case. So this is more like our metadata at Crossref. Uh, maybe we're missing some things from the metadata that we collect. It's still very useful. It's still a fairly accurate picture. Um, and we distribute your metadata quite widely. Um, but it's not perfect. There are gaps in what we collect. It's not as comprehensive as we would like. Um, this might be because the missing pieces aren't easy to define. Um, our members might not have asked us to support something yet. Or maybe they have and we haven't quite had the right conversation at the right time um, in order to do this. However, this is also the reality for a lot of our members. Um, so they aren't able to send us um, many chunks of MESS data, and this might be for various reasons. It, it could be that they just don't have this information to send us. Um, they might not be able to afford to send us this through the vendors that they work with, or perhaps they don't recognize the value in sending this um, information to Crossref. Uh, but our goal is to collect all the relevant MESS data in a way that connects our members' mess data to the larger, the larger scholarly community landscape. And we want to facilitate this process for all of our members um, using enhanced tools, reports, and education so that our members are able to send us metadata that's connected, standardized, optimized, cite, link, and assess, and that's fully comprehensive and magical, like this Crossref unicorn. So I'm now going to talk to you about a new tool that we've developed in the last year or so, which is called Participation Reports. So first of all, I'll tell you a little bit more about the reports themselves. So what are they? They are a place where you can go to check what metadata you're registering with Crossref. They're open and they're free to use by anyone. So you can see what metadata that you are sending. They allow you to track levels of metadata over time. And this is also really handy if you're using service providers or you're not directly responsible for registering the metadata for your content yourself. And they allow our members to measure up uh, to other members to compare your metadata to another member and to see where there are gaps um, so that you can improve your own metadata records. And why did we create them? Well, as I was just um, displaying with the zebras, um, it's mainly because we've been hearing from our members at conferences, in emails to our support team and on calls and meetings that they're not always sure what MESS data they're registering with us. So we decided to make it easier uh, for our members and also for ourselves to see what MESS data has been registered. The data has been available for quite a long time via our REST API, but not everyone knew how to query our API. It's not very user friendly and it's much more geared at machines, um, so there's not an easy uh, user interface to use for it. And how can we expect um, people to fix things if they're not sure exactly what's missing? And why is comprehensive metadata important? Well, as Rachel and Paul were talking about, registering your content isn't just about getting a persistent identifier for your work. It's about where your metadata goes after you register it with Crossref and how many other organizations can use that metadata to find the content that you publish. Because Crossref's um, metadata is standardized and machine readable, it's really useful to many organizations that make your content more discoverable through their tools and services. And here are a few examples on the screen. So this could be manuscript tracking tools, bibliographic management, library discovery services, in metrics and analytics, 
author profile tools, um, specialist databases, the uses are ever growing. On an average, we see uh, over 600 million uh, metadata queries per month across all of our different interfaces. And this is increasing each year. And this represents uh, individuals and organizations who are trying to discover and deliver content and provide services for the research community. Lots of people use the data, so it's really important to know what you are sending to Crossref. And this is where participation reports can help. So how exactly do you know what you're sending to Crossref? Well, this is where you would start. So you would go to our, our page here, where the um, address is on the screen. Um, so crossref.org forward slash members forward slash uh, prep. And you can also find documentation to help on our website. And here you would come up with a screen where you can find a member. So you can just enter a member's name. And if you're not sure what your name is, this is the same name that you receive on your invoice. Um, so you can search for yourself or you can search for other members as well. When you select your desired organization, you'll see the main page um, of the report and the information about that organization. Um, and here on the screen is an example um, of a member's report, and this is F1000 Research. At the top, you can see the name of the organization and also the total number of content items or DOIs that they have registered with us. The page also shows what percentage um, items have certain metadata elements deposited. So these are the elements that we have considered important to make content more useful and easy to discover. So this includes references, um, um, open references, ORCID, DOI, uh, ORCID identifiers, financial information, such as the funder ID and funding award numbers, um, cross rack information, text mining URLs, uh, URLs for licenses, and also for the similarity check service and abstracts. And each has a percentage shown alongside it. If you have multiple titles, each one will have its own result. Um, and may the results may differ because different editors registered their content. And this is the same for different content types. Uh, so at the top on the left there, there's a drop down arrow next to journal article. If you clicked this, it would drop down and there'd be a list of different content types and you could select which one if you um, deposit information for different content types like books and journal articles, for example. On the right hand side, you can also search um, in terms of whether you are searching for current content or you can drop down the list and there will be an option for back file content. So this is content published um, prior to two years ago, or you can search by all time. And this again might change the results that you see on the screen. For example, older content, um, an art, a journal article published in 1960, for example, that's probably not going to have an ORCID ID. Um, and you can also update your metadata and add more information for backfail content, as well as new content um, as you go. Um, so sharing metadata is really important um, for discovery. Please do remember that we only share your metadata and not the full text. Um, so as, if you want to add or update metadata for an existing item, there are several methods, as Paul talked about earlier. The metadata manager tool can be used to make changes um, to the metadata for previously registered content, even if that content was initially registered using OJS or the X, uh, XML or the web deposit form. If you use metadata manager to update the content, you just change the fields with the new data. It's not necessary to re-enter the entire record. If you use OJS to register your content with us and you want to make a change to the article's metadata, a new metadata can be redeposited through the Crossref plugin. And if you use OJS 3.1.2 or later, it's possible then to deposit your references as well using the plugin. The simple text query tool can also be used to search and deposit references. Additionally, funding and license information can be bulk deposited using a CSV file um, using um, or using the web deposit form. And there's never a charge for adding or updating metadata. Updated metadata can be viewed in the participation report in approximately 24 hours after you've made um, these additions with us. If you want to find out more about that, uh, we do have monthly participation report webinars, which you can find on our website. Um, we also advise you to just take a look at your report and um, have a explore and see what you can find. Feel free to ask us any questions. 
And if you want to schedule your own metadata health check, a one-on-one -on -one with a Crossref member of staff, you can email us at feedback at crossref.org and we can schedule that for you. So we're going to talk a little bit more now about some of our services at Crossref um, that are available to members who are registering content with us. Um, so Crossref members have access to a variety of services that help record, link and distribute the metadata of their research. So we're going to talk about each of these briefly and explain how they can help with the quality and discovery of your content. Um, and these are the services that we're going to talk about today. So we're going to touch on reference linking, cited by, similarity check and cross mark. As I said, we're only going to talk about um, each of these quite briefly. Um, so if you do have any questions, you can send these to us. Um, we'll either answer them today or we'll get back to you with more information later. So first up is reference linking. And what is this? So it means that you hyperlink with Crossref DOIs when you create your citation list. And why is this important? So um, this is a solution that makes it possible for readers to follow a DOI link from a reference list of a published piece of work to the location of the full text document on, a, on another member's publishing platform. And this builds a network infrastructure that enhances scholarly communications on the, on the web. Because DOI links don't break over time, the, the DOI in the reference list should always take the reader to the location of the referenced article. Reference linking is an obligation for Crossref members. So if you're a member, you should be linking your reference list using DOIs where there are DOIs available. Um, you can see in this example from Peer J that if you hovered over the link in the reference list, um, you can see at the bottom there, um, in the screenshot that it, the link has been made by the DOI. So publishers used to sign individual agreements between each other um, in order to be able to link to each other's content. But obviously this just wasn't sustainable as publishing grew. Um, and so Crossref was formed to provide a central solution to this. And this is why it's an obligation if you're a member. Um, it just creates this network. It makes content more discoverable for everyone. So reference linking is accomplished by members and their production teams with the assistance of authors and editors who add the links to the references in the articles. You can ask your authors to add DOIs to their reference lists, or you can add this later at a copy, copy editing stage. And there are a number of different ways to add DOIs to references. Um, you can do this via a search engine, which is very easy, but it's quite slow. Um, you can query cross, the Crossref API with XML, which is really efficient, but it does require some skill um, with XML. And we also have our own lookup tools, um, which I'll show you uh, one of them in the next slide. And some third parties also enable this, such as OJS, which has launched um, an updated plugin for reference deposits. And at Crossref, our new uh, metadata manager tool will help you to link and deposit your preferences as well. Um, so this is an example of one of our um, search um, lookup tools. This is the simple text query form. So this allows you to match reference lists uh, to any DOI in the Crossref system. So you can simply copy and paste your reference list into the box. Um, just as a, a free text, make sure that there's a space between each of the references um, and you can click submit. And we'll bring you back all of the references um, plus the matching DOIs so that you can add them into your reference list. And you can also deposit them directly uh, via the tool. Not all references will have DOIs. Um, and if there's no DOI for a piece of work that's referenced, there's no obligation to link to it. Um, if a piece of work is later registered with us and assigned a DOI in the system, this will automatically update this new match for you in the metadata. It may not be instant, it takes a bit of time to do that, but it will um, eventually filter through and we can update that view. Um, so I'm now going to move on to talking about uh, one of our other services, which is Cited By. Um, and Cited By provides a clear overview of the publications that have cited a piece of content. Um, so a good stop, uh, a good step, next step once you're linking your references is to look into participating in our Cited By service. 
Um, so it allows our members to show authors and readers what other Crossref content is citing their content. Um, and researchers cite the work of other people, obviously, to confirm the material they've used when they're writing their articles. And it helps them to be able to see, it helps to be able to see who, which articles are citing a post that you're reading and how they've contributed um, to develop their ideas and, and question them. This is the main function of Cited By, to show the number of citations and link to the publications that quote you. You can request this information from Crossref and then you can display it on your website in whatever format that you like. You can see an example of Cited By on the screen. Um, this is what it can look like. So by clicking on the list of Cited By matches, you can then see the items that reference the article that you're reading perhaps helping you to find more relevant research. There are many online citation indexing services and databases, but what's different about Cited By is that it lets our members display the Cited By links of their content on their own website in any way that they wish. It also only counts the citations that we see in Crossref, so it may differ from other citation scores as they're looking at a different set of data, which is looking at what's in our system. Cited by benefits the readers of the content because they can get a sense of how often that content's been cited and can easily click the links to go to that citing content. How often something is cited can also be useful information for publishers, authors, research institutions and funders. So if you're interested in participating, we can walk you through the steps. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is deposit references with Crossref for your articles. This is required. Uh, once you've done that, you're then eligible to participate in Cited By. And you can email us at member at crossref.org um, to ask for your account to be enabled for this service. Once enabled, you can then query Crossref for all the DOIs that are citing your content, and you can display the results on your website however you choose. Cited By is optional, um, but there is no fee for participating. So as I said, once your account has been enabled to Cited By, you can then ask or query Crossref for the articles that we can see that cite in your content. The simplest way to do this is to log into our admin system at doi.crossref.org and enter the DOI that you want to query. This will then uh, return a list of other articles that are citing it. For XML users, you can query by uploading XML files to our deposit system and we'll run a, uh, we will return a list of the matched citations. And there's more information on how to do this on our edge in our education documentation um, and you can find the link there on the screen um, as i've said earlier we'll be sending the copy of all of these slides so you don't need to be making a note of the the links as we go okay so i'm now going to pass over to um, my colleague kirsty who's going to talk to you a bit more about some of our other services similarity check and crossmark Thank you, Vanessa. Um, can everybody hear me? I think I've unmuted. Yes, we can hear you. Right. So yeah, I'm going to talk about um, two of our additional services, Similarity Check and Crossmark. <coughs> um, Similarity Check is a um, way in which you can screen incoming manuscripts and compare them against other documents to make sure that um, the content is original. So really, it's a, it's a tool that helps editors to prevent plagiarism. And how it works is that our members are given access to our partner, Turnitin's powerful text comparison tool. It's called Authenticate. You may also be familiar with the Turnitin system itself, which is often used in universities and schools. And Authenticate allows you to compare your incoming manuscripts against the largest comparison database of full text academic content that's available. There are other plagiarism screening tools available, but using Authenticate as a similarity check member is quite unique as it creates a relationship between the content owners and Turnitin. So it's kind of a two-way um, service. Similarity check members have a vastly reduced fee for the use of Authenticate because in turn, they contribute their own published content into Turnitin's database of full text literature. This means that as the number of similarity check members grow, so does the size of the Authenticate content database. And with more content in the database, 
um, obviously you're comparing against uh, many, many more documents and gives you much greater peace of mind um, if you're looking to determine a manuscript's original, originality. So just to, to uh, describe Authenticate a little bit more, it is a software tool. As I say, it's not Crossref software. It's owned by our partner company, Turnitin. And Similarity Check is the name of the service which combines the Authenticate tool um, and Crossref membership. It basically compares text against text and it's looking for matches in, in those texts. So if you upload a manuscript to Authenticate, it compares it against the Turnitin database, which contains huge amounts of content. So it's a billion web pages that they crawl um, daily and refresh. 60 or so million content items in the Crossref system that have been contributed by Similarity Check participants and 100 million items from other content providers, um, such as those listed here on the screen. And there are two ways to use Authenticate. You can either use it directly by going to authenticate.com in your browser, or you can use it via an integration with your submission system. So if you use something like Editorial Manager or Scholar One Manuscripts, um, they have got Authenticate integrated into those systems so that you can upload via your submission system. So this is how it works. Um, you upload a document to Authenticate, as I say, either directly or through um, your submission system. And that document can be in a number of formats, Word, text, PDF, HTML. And when you do that, a similarity report is produced. And that's what you're looking at on this screenshot here. And what it's showing you is overlap between the manuscript that you've uploaded and other content in the database. So then you can actually start to look. So on, on the left here is the similarity report with a different color coding. On the right, you've got where those matches have come from. And if you click on the sources on the right, it'll jump you to the content um, that matches in the document. So this is, this is a tool to help in assessing the originality of content. You'll see on the top right of the screen that there is an original similarity score of 39%. It's very important um, to make sure that you don't just use the score itself. Um, that's just an indicator. It may be that actually, as in this particular example, you can see the matches are from lots and lots of different places. So this author clearly hasn't just copied and pasted this entire section from somewhere else. There just happens to be overlap in certain phrases. So it's very important to actually look at the reports themselves and interpret um, what's going on there. And whenever, you, if you're participating in Similarity Check, whenever you register new content uh, and create new DOIs for your content, you provide a link to your full text, which Turnitin then uses to index the item and add it back into the database. So that database is constantly expanding and being kept up to date with the latest content. Another example of a similarity report. Again, you've got the percentage um, and the matches. Um, and just again, really to stress that the score itself is not really enough to go on. Obviously, if you get initially a high similarity score, that's a, a trigger to go and look more closely at the similarity report. If you get a very low similarity score, you might not need to worry about going to have a look at it. It may be that um, some of the matching content is perfectly legitimate, such as properly cited references or st standard scientific descriptions. For example, we find that the materials and methods sections are often very similar because there are only so many ways that you can describe the way a certain experiment is done. You also need to watch out for um, any matches with preprint content, particularly since Crossref has been um, enabling the registration of preprint content. So there may be a perfectly legitimate preprint out there on the internet somewhere that will match with a submitted manuscript. There are ways within Authenticate for you to exclude certain, certain sections. So you can exclude the references section um, from being checked for matches. You can exclude the um, method section and you can also um, change other um, variables by saying that perhaps you don't want to see any matches that are under a certain number of words, for example. So what kind of things are um, publishers looking for when they use similarity check? It's really a combination of um, perfectly legitimate mistakes that authors might make. So if they've just not um, 
not added in their references or put their references in correctly. Um, the editor can obviously go back and say, you know, you need to fix this piece. Um, it may be that they've been using their own content, uh, what used to be known as self-plagiarism, but is more commonly referred to as text recycling these days. And again, you can go back with a recommendation to the author um, that they fix that um, and, and um, state their... Hmm. Excuse me, I bring a glass of water, um, that they rephrase their work in a different way. But it might also be that there are um, more serious issues, and it could be that they are actually using another per person's work and not attributing that properly, submitting another person's work as your own, um, which is clearly unethical, or attempts to deliberately mislead or misrepresent. So it's a tricky area, um, and as I say, Quite often the things that are flagged up are just legitimate mistakes that authors have not understood how to cite things properly, but it can also help you to um, weed out those more rare cases where authors are being deceitful about the originality of their work. So in order to join Similarity Check, you must obviously be registering content and assigning DOIs to your content. So one of the obligations, as I said, it's kind of a two-way service. In order to use the Authenticate tool, you need to be adding your content to the Turnitin database. The way that Turnitin indexes content is by looking in Crossref metadata for uh, what we call as-crawled URLs, which are essentially URLs that link directly to your full text, whether that's PDF, XML, HTML. And in order to participate in Similarity Check, you must be providing full text URLs for at least 90% of the content that you register with, content, with, with Crossref. So this URL, as I said, links directly to your full text and it's used by crawlers, uh, robots, bots, uh, at Turnitin to come and find your full text content and index it. Turnitin adds that to their database and then it's used to compare against submitted manuscripts. It's important to note that although Turnitin is crawling your full text content, it's not providing access to anyone else for it. Full text matches are shown within the Authenticate tool. So if your manuscript shows a match to a published article, you can look at those side by side within Authenticate, um, but the, the content isn't displayed anywhere else for anybody else, so it's very secure. If you're registering new content, you should include the um, similarity check URL as standard as part of your deposit metadata. If you need to update back file content with similarity check URLs, um, you can do so um, just by adding um, similarity check URLs through the web deposit form, for example. We've got this tool on our website where you can put your member name and your member ID in, and it will tell you what percentage of your content has similarity check URLs. So you can see at the point at which you hit 90% or higher, um, you're eligible to join similarity check and this form will then send you to an application form for the similarity check service. So there are a separate set of terms and conditions for similarity check um, that you need to agree to. So you apply um, and if you meet the criteria, we'll work with Turnitin to get your account set up um, and you'll be given login details for Authenticate. There's lots more information about um, Turnitin, full text URLs, and all of the things that are part of this service in our Get Started guide, um, which is at crossref.org get started similarity check. And the URL on this page is for this form where you can check how many of your um, DOIs have similarity check URLs. There are additional fees for similarity check, one of the few things that we charge extra for. So we charge an annual admin fee, which is equivalent to 20% of your Crossref membership fee. So for example, if you pay $275 a year as a member of Crossref, the admin fee for Similarity Check will be an additional $55 per year. And that's invoiced with your annual fee each year in January. And then there's a fee for each manuscript that you check using Authenticate. I think I mentioned before that this is a vastly reduced fee compared to if you um, have a contract directly with Turnitin to use their services. This is negotiated via Crossref because of the uh, volume of members and content that we bring to the service. So the first 100 documents every year are free of charge. After this, the fee per document that you check is 75 US cents, 
for the first 5,000 documents. And then there's a scale of um, discounts for volumes, as you can see. So if you check over 5,000 documents, it's 65 cents per document and so on and so forth. And the document checking fees are invoiced annually um, in January by Crossref. So that similarity check, that was, a, was, as Vanessa said, a very brief overview. So please do get in touch with us if you um, want to find out more or go to our website. There's a comprehensive set of documentation on how to get started with, with similarity check. And now I'm gonna move on to Crossmark, which is another additional service. Um, Crossmark is really all about making sure that readers of content can see um, if anything changes after publication. And it's all about building trust for the reader. So if they're looking at an article, they want to know that it's been, perhaps that it's been peer reviewed, that the publisher is taking responsibility for making sure that even after publication, it's maintained and any changes that happen to that content are flagged to the reader. As we know, content can change after publication. Um, there are many, many examples of corrections that happen to content, um, some of them very minor, some of them quite important, and you've got much more serious things such as retractions. Um, and it's really important that publishers as custodians of that content um, are able to make those changes and convey them to the readers. So Crossmark came about because um, we realized there was a, a need for um, publishers to be able to easily communicate these changes to readers, but also in a standard way from publisher to publisher. So the Crossmark service consists of um, a few things. It involves a button that you put on your abstract pages and in your full text PDFs. And when readers click on that button, a box pops up, which tells them if any changes have been made to that content. So if there is anything like a correction or an errata to that content. The second part of it is that you deposit metadata about those updates to Crossref. So if something is corrected, you send a, you register a DOI for a correction notice and that lives in Cross, Crossref metadata, um, which is machine readable through all of our APIs. So other people can access that. So here's an example. Um, you can see the check for updates, the cross mark button on this article. If you click on this one, um, the example on the right is the cross mark box that pops up and you'll see that it says that this document's current. So since publication, nothing has happened to this document to change either the uh, meaning interpretation or, or, um, or facts within the document. You'll also see that below the green box that says document is current, there's other metadata that the reader can explore. So there's an author section. These are all pop-out boxes. So if you click on the arrow, it'll list the authors with their orchids if they have them. Um, clinical trial information, funding information, license information. These are all um, metadata fields that my colleagues have talked about earlier in the webinar. Um, and if you're depositing those, we'll automatically bring those into your Crossmark box to make them much more visible to the reader. Here's an example of um, a, an article where an update is available. So again, the readers clicked on the cross mark button and this time the box is popping up and saying, there's an update available. In this case, it's a corrigendum. Um, the types of updates that you can register, we've got a set of 12 standard terms that are the most commonly used um, update types. So that includes very common things such as correction, errata, um, Retraction, obviously, withdrawal, um, they're all available to look at on our website. So this one's a corrigendum and it's got a link there. If you click to view the corrigendum, that will take you through to the uh, correction notice that the publisher has published explaining what's changed and why. And here's another example. In this case, clicking on the cross map button brings up the box and shows you that this article has actually been retracted. And again, the publisher has registered a retraction notice with Crossref and the reader can click on that link, go to the retraction notice and find out why um, this article has been retracted. It's really important to stress that um, these updates are, shouldn't be seen as negative. It's very much a publisher's responsibility to um, curate uh, and steward the content after it's been published. And so if an error does come to light, 
um, correcting the scientific record as a publisher is the right thing to do. And oftentimes these corrections and retractions are not because of any kind of misconduct, but through genuine error or um, author mistakes, so on and so forth. So it's, it's not a negative thing to flag these things to readers. It's very much a, an emphasis on the publisher's role of making sure that the scientific record is kept correct. As I said, the Crossmark box will automatically display additional metadata if you submit it. So that can include information about the funding for the uh, research, the licenses, ORCID IDs for the authors with links out to their ORCID profile. Um, if you're collecting clinical trial numbers, if you're in um, that particular subject area, you can send those to us in your metadata. And then at the bottom of the Crossmark box, there is um, a, an additional section called um, What's it called? More information, I think. Um, and there you can put in absolutely anything you want. It's basically a free text box for any additional metadata that you want to display. Commonly used um, metadata there are publishers will display the publication history. So the date of which the manuscript was received, accepted and published. Um, you can state there that you are running your content through similarity check to check for plagiarism. You can pretty much say anything you want there. Um, so that's not a nice flexible place for you to display additional information. Here's an example of the more information section for this for a particular article. And as you see, this um, particular journal has got lots of additional metadata. They're explaining the peer review method that's been used for the content, the publication history, they've got links out to supplementary materials, copyright and licensing statements, um, and the type of content that's a research paper in this particular publication. So it's very flexible for you to put whatever you like in there. We've seen pretty good um, uptake of the Crossmark service. We've got about a thousand members who are depositing Crossmark metadata and putting the Crossmark button on their um, websites. As with everything at Crossref, the Crossmark metadata goes into our APIs so that other people can access that. So you can query our API to see whether a particular article has had any updates. Of those, from those thousand publishers who are depositing Crossmark metadata, we've got about 150,000 updates available to content. Most of those, the vast majority of those are corrections or errata. Around 5,000 of those updates are retractions. So it's a small percentage, but it's really important that if something is retracted, um, readers are able to know that. They may have referenced that in their own writing and want, may want to correct that if they've referenced something that's been shown to be incorrect. It's obviously a free service for the researchers. Anyone can click on the Crossmark button um, and see that additional metadata. And as with everything at Crossref, this is richer metadata. If you can register updates to your content with Crossref, that's enriching your metadata and making it far more useful for far more users and other services. In order to participate in Crossmark, you really just need to start doing it, to be honest. Um, one of the things that you do need to do is create what we call a Crossmark policy page. And this really simply is a page on your website that explains that you're participating in Crossmark and lists out things like your um, information for authors. So the policies that you have about plagiarism, about correcting content, so on and so forth. And you do need to assign a DOI to this page and register it. So it's a web page that you assign a DOI to so that it won't change, that we can persistently link to it. And you register that with Crossref. Then you can just start depositing Crossmark metadata as part of your regular metadata deposit. At its absolute simplest, if there are no updates, this is just a small snippet of metadata that includes the DOI of the content. Again, more details of this available on our website. Um, but obviously you need to also start um, registering any updates that should happen to your content um, as they appear. As with the similarity check URLs, you can deposit Crossmark metadata for your current content, just as you would with your normal deposits, but you can also go through your back file and just add Crossmark metadata separately. And then you need to add the Crossmark button to your articles. And again, there's a snippet of code that you can just embed into your web pages that will make the Crossmark button display and allow the Crossmark box to pop up for the reader. 
There used to be fees for Crossmark. There was an additional per DOI deposit fee, um, but we stopped charging for Crossmark in 2020. So now it's completely free, just part of your regular metadata uh, registration if you want to participate. And you, you also have the option if you want to, to deposit update metadata um, about corrections and retractions, even if you're not displaying the button. Um, we really want to make sure that we get as much metadata about corrections and retractions as possible and understand that actually implementing the button in the box is a little bit more tricky. Um, so if you want to just get started with the metadata side of things and then add the crossmark button later, that's also perfectly acceptable. So that's been a kind of whistle-stop tour of two services that are um, hugely useful. Um, we get so much feedback about how valuable similarity check and crossmark are. Um, but there's a lot more detail to them, so please do ask us any questions or go and have a look on our website for more information about either Similarity Check or Crossmark. And I think that's the end of my section and I'm passing back to Vanessa, maybe? Rachel. Yeah, or mine. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsty. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes just to um, just to talk you through um, some of the community initiatives that we're involved with at, at Crossref. So Kirsty had just talked about um, enriching your, um, your metadata and I'd also talked a bit about how our schema and the information that we collect is evolving over time to collect more information related to, um, related to research. And one of the things that we have been working on um, and working with is ROAR or the Research Organization Registry. And ROAR is a community driven effort. It's led by four steering organizations. So um, Crossref, Datasite, the California Digital Library and Digital Science. And it's a project that's aimed specifically on um, on addressing a, an, the affiliation use case. So being able to identify which organizations are affiliated or related to which to what research art outputs. So where, which, which universities, which, um, which universities, which research centers are researchers coming from um, and where, and, and where are they publishing? Um, we're trying to keep the, the scope focused on building a registry or a list of open identifiers for organizations that, that conduct research um, so, that, um, so that we can identify at a high level which, which affiliations or which institutions researchers are, are coming from for, for a variety of reasons. So on the next slide, I tried to, um, to kind of talk through why we're doing this. Um, at the moment in Crossref, um, organizations, um, organizations are trying to, um, to link to, to institutions using ROAR IDs. Um, Kirsty, I don't know if you can go back a slide or maybe, oh yeah, that's the one, perfect, thank you. Um, so, this is kind of describing what we're what we're trying to do with with ROAR. At the moment, um, if you're registering content with Crossref, you can provide us with um, the name or the affiliation information of the authors of a paper. Um, but that's only a free text field, which causes problems. As you know, institutions can have many names or similar names. So um, in this example, UCLA could be put in as just UCLA. It could be put down as one of the schools within UCLA or, um, or another organization with the same initials. And it's really hard to, to definitively associate that with a researcher. So if I wanted to find research from UCLA Medical School, if my journal wanted to be able to track, um, for example, um, institutional publishing agreements or just help provide accurate and consistent affiliations, that's really difficult to do. So ROAR provides a list um, of over 98,000 um, organizations matched to an identifier. And 
in the next um, in the next couple of months, we're going to start to collect rower IDs in the affiliations field in Crossref metadata. Um, and the way that will be collected will be via integrations in various submission systems and in the systems that we have to, to collect metadata. Once you collect that information from authors, then that can be sent to, um, to Crossref in the metadata so that we're able to um, effectively identify and, and begin to be able to show data, um, I guess, um, I guess, comprehensive and um, accurate data on where the affiliation information regarding researchers. So if you're a journal editor, it can be really useful to see which university are my authors coming from, um, where are my reviewers based, um, identify potential conflicts of interest, and also um, places that are conducting research that are relevant to your, to your journals. So instead, this is open information, focused on research affiliations and it's a community-led project so we don't have a lot of time to cover it today there's a webinar coming up that's posted in our community forum if you want to find out more and there's also um, information on how you can contact ROAR directly at the bottom of this slide. The other initiative that we're involved in is, um, is Make Data Count. We're a non-funded partner in this, along with the other organisations you can see on the slide. Um, but Make Data Count is an initiative to focus on um, and help with the widespread adoption of standardised data usage and data citation practices. So um, the building blocks for recognising um, and crediting researchers for sharing the data that underlies their research. So Make Data Count has three broad aims. Um, increased adoption of standardized data usage across different re repositories. So more and more um, there are requirements um, on researchers to be able to share the data that underlies their research which can help with reproducibility of that research and the transparency between how the, the research results were, were generated. At Crossref, um, we're trying to support the second aim in supporting the um, publishers in registering citations to data in their reference lists with us. And we'll be working with publisher advocacy groups and societies to try to, to, try to help publishers with that and to promote it. To help um, in, to provide, provide incentives for researchers to share their data, we have to provide information on how that data is used, if it's downloaded, if it's viewed, and if it's cited in the research. And we want to um, make the data around that openly available. So um, by, by supporting the, the, reg, um, the, the provision of citations to data in the Crossref metadata, we can help reward researchers for doing this and show how their data is, is being used, which is also important for, for funded projects. And finally, we we talked a little bit um, earlier in the presentation about integrations with um, with open journal systems, which is run by the the Public Knowledge Project or PKP. Um, we became um, a strategic partner of PKP back um, in twenty nineteen, and what that means is that we sort of formalised our working relationship with PKP, and we meet with them um, every couple of months to review where we are with things. Um, so we have a, a working group between our organisations to look at what our members are asking for with OJS, and then also to combine that with ongoing, um, with ongoing developments in OJS, support materials and education. Um, because as I said, we know that so many of our, um, our members are reliant on OJS to participate in Crossref and other related services. Um, we're about to sign off some work so that they can improve the OJS plugin and other, um, other related plugins to support additional Crossref services, such as Crossmark, and, um, which Kirsty has just talked about, 
and cited by which Vanessa mentioned earlier. So there's there will be ongoing work to improve that to better support members over the next over the next year. Um, and PKP also act as a sponsor for some organisations to help them to join Crossref when they when they might struggle to do so otherwise. So we recognise that this is a really good central way to support lots of the organisations that are that are trying to work with us and provide technical, educational and other support to make sure that they can easily participate in Crossref services. So further, further help and, and support, um, I'm going to pass that back. Thanks, Rachel. There, um, there are quite a few ways in which you can actually contact us at Crossref for further help and support. Um, here is our community forum. The link in the bottom left will, will get you to that. And here you can ask your question and post it on the forum there. We have um, internal staff at Crossref and ambassadors of Crossref who monitor this um, forum and they will help with um, answering any questions that you might have. Uh, we also have a dedicated support team and you can contact us with any technical issues either via the website uh, listed um, on the slide or by emailing support at crossref.org. Um, the last bullet point there is actually um, slightly out of date. You can um, get some great information on how to uh, deposit, maintain, retrieve metadata from us, um, information on our services, um, lots of technical explanations and examples and um, you can visit, uh, visit uh, our new documentation, uh, education documentation, um, which uh, Vanessa's I think going to pop the link in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. That will be on the slides when they'll be updated on the slides when it's sent out. Um, and of course, you can always uh, submit requests uh, which are more specific. Um, to support at crossref.org and um, we will try and get to that ticket and answer as quickly as possible. Oh, and here's a, a list of uh, some useful links. So there's the documentation link that uh, Vanessa's just popped in, which is great. That's the update one. Uh, the community forum and here's some important email addresses that you might want to contact us on one for our support team uh, our membership team and our billing team and you can also view um, past webinars recordings of webinars that um, have been made um, via that link there as well you can also follow us on twitter uh, our twitter handles uh, are there listed above at crossref.org and at crossref support. Uh, we also have a blog which is updated quite regularly and has some really interesting um, stuff to read about crossref. Um, and you can also send us feedback via the email address at the bottom. Uh, I mentioned it earlier in the webinar, but please do help us keep our records up to date, um, making sure the right contact and person and, and email address is on our system so that we can get in touch if we need to. Um, that, that's always great. And if you need any changes in contact details or against your account, then please email the membership team at that email address there. And I think with that, we're perfectly on time um, for ending our webinar today. Um, thank you to um, all of our presenters. Um, thank you to Rachel, Kirsty, and Paul. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, we hope that you found this useful. Um, if you do have any other questions, you can contact us via any of the ways that Paul just mentioned, our community forum, send us an email, um, and check out our education documentation as well. I'll be sending the recording, the slides and the Q&A uh, around via email and we'll also post this in our community forum. So thank you everyone.